Okay, guys, let's do it. <laughs> so, I'm happy to say I've gotten through, I think, um, almost all of Monday's exam. And I, that was the one I was the most worried about because I thought I made the essays too hard. And almost everyone, not almost everyone, most people got it. So that makes me feel okay. <laughs> the rest of you guys haven't taken it yet. So, so, so I've, been, I've been very worried that the essays won't be fair between the three different classes. And so as long as the same proportion of people get it right in all three, I will feel good. And so far, things are looking really good. Um, based on the lack of questions I had also on Wednesday. Um, okay, let's move on. Okay, so we were talking about the cell cycle. Um, I, for those of you who have 408, I'm very sorry. You're going to be bored out of your minds these first few days. But I think it's really hard to talk about the cell cycle in terms of S phase and mitosis if you don't understand it at all. So you're going to hear a little bit of repeat. There's some overlap. Uh, so we've been talking about regulation of CDKs by cyclins um, and regulation of CDKs by phosphorylation, either activating or inactivating, uh, so positive or negative re regulation. Regulation of CDKs by CKIs, and I introduced the ubiquitin proteasome system, and then time was up. <coughs> so this is kind of where we ended with Oscar the Grouch, um, and this is where I was just telling you that the proteasome is not just a cellular trash can, but it is a trash can, but it's not just this place that makes all the proteins go to die. There's a lot of regulation involved in what is being degraded. And that's pretty much how this all function by regulated degradation of different proteins. There's no one here today again, right? I mean, you guys are people. You're here. Thank you for being here. But every now and then, I'm like, where are those people? Those. Okay. Anyways, um, so that's where we ended, and we went through this small exercise of um, kind of just trying to think about what we had just learned, and think about the types of proteins that you might want to degrade in the context of the cell cycle to either turn something on or turn something off. And I got a lot of great examples. People said cyclins, which is the most obvious. Um, and some people said CKIs, which is another good one. And there's some more. Um, and then we also talked about how um, it's not only degradation of proteins that shuts things off, it's, it's also you have to think about transcriptional upregulation to turn, when you're turning things on also, because if you degrade all your cyclins, you need to also make more as you're approaching whatever phase of the cell cycle you're going into. Okay, you guys all following me? Right. Okay. So, again, those stupid lights. Um, so, in talking about degradation of proteins, I've got some examples. There's two main ubiquitin ligases involved in regulation of the cell cycle. One is APC, which stands for anaphase promoting complex. You shouldn't have to think too hard about what it does because it's in the name. It promotes anaphase. It promotes exit from, uh, from mitosis. If APC is not activated, you will not exit mitosis. Um, and so it's ubiquitin ligase. And what I mean by ubiquitin, oh, I forgot to bring my list of students. What I mean by ubiquitin ligase, it's that third enzyme in the ubiquitination reaction that binds to the specific substrate that's going to be degraded. Um, so uh, here's an example of two. There are many different proteins that are degraded by these cubicles and ligases, but I'm going to give you an example of a few. So APC degrades securin 
which is involved in sister chromic's head cohesion, um, which is logical, right? If you want to go from metaphase to anaphase, you want to be able to separate your sister chromatids, right? No? Is any? Oh God, are you guys are you guys there? I like nodding heads. Huh? Huh? <coughs> Securing and separate. Securing and separate. So you're you're thinking about securing and separate. Okay. Yeah. Secure it. So so securing is what inhibits separate, and you degrade secure and activate separates, which then will degrade complete. But don't worry about that because I haven't gone there, and I don't. Well, I'll talk about it a little. Um. So that's one thing that's degraded, and then as well as S and M cyclins. So here's how APC works. You have inactive APC, and it has this activating subunit that's required to turn on APC. So APC is only on during certain phases of the cell cycle. Logical, because you only want it on when you want to degrade the things that need to be degraded. For example, you probably don't want APC active at the beginning of S phase because it degrades S cyclins and that would be bad for going into S phase, right? So anyway, so whether or not APC is active or not, that's also regulated actually by CDK. Um, so when APC is bound by CDC20, it's on and that results in polyubiquitination of, for example, M cyclin, which is then degraded by the proteasome. Okay, so that's one ubiquitin ligase that's involved in regulating the cell cycle. Then there's also SCF. SCF stands for skip colon F box, and that's because it's a uh, protein complex <coughs> that acts as ubiquitin ligase that contains a colon subunit and an F box subunit and a skip subunit. Don't worry about that because I've never asked you what subunits are, but sometimes it helps to remember things if you know what these letters stand for. Um, and so SCF, they, it also is active at certain points in the cell cycle and degrades a whole bunch of different targets. One example is degradation of CKIs, right? That's logical. CKIs inhibit uh, CDK cyclins from being active, and sometimes they are they bind cyclin CDK complexes, and then are degraded when the cell is ready to activate that enzyme complex. Um, so SCF ubiquitin ligases recognize phosphorylated substrates. So you'll have your CKI, and then they'll be phosphorylated, probably by a C. Recognized by the F box protein, polyubiquinated, degraded, thus shutting off the activity of that CKI and activating the cyclin CDK that was bound by it. Okay? Um, so there's two ways of regulating the activity of these ubiquitin <coughs> ligases, right, that I showed you. One with the APC, it's whether or not that activating subunit can bind and that's regulated by phosphorylation by a CDK. And then here, it's phosphorylation of the, the substrate, so it can be recognized by the ubiquitin ligase, okay? So, um, does anyone have any questions about this? Yes. Huh? Do they both happen concurrently? No. So SCFs and um, <coughs> SCFs and APC are active at very different times in the cell cycle. Yeah, they're they are, and they're actually slightly involved in regulating the activity of the <coughs> yeah. Any other questions? Good question. Does anyone wonder why I'm talking about ubiquitin? Other than I love it. <laughs> Who loves ubiquitin? Okay, you have a half hand raise, a real two few real hand raises. Okay. 
Good. I didn't get over here yet. You guys all put your hands down already. You were all like. <laughs> Okay. There's, an, there's a ubiquitin conference I used to go to every year, which I have no reason to go to right now, which makes me very sad. Um, hopefully I'll get to go to it again in another year or two. And it's like four days on ubiquitin. Ubiquitin is involved in regulating um, all the clock proteins involved in circadian rhythms and sleep-wake cycles. It's, it's very cool. Cool stuff. Anyways. Okay, so... She's talking about ubiquitin again. Okay, so CYK1 is a yeast CKI, which inhibits S-cyclin CDK and M-cyclin CDK, and it must be degraded to allow entry to F2. So this is an example of how this might all kind of come together in cell cycle regulation, right? So CYK1, it binds to and, and inhibits S-CDK, and it binds to and inhibits M-CDKs. And so it's turned off by um, phosphorylation by G1S cyclin CDK over here. So that turns it off, and that way it's not around when you need to go into S phase, right? So phosphorylation by G1S cyclin CDK targets CYK1 for proteasomal degradation. So you're degrading your CKI prior to entry into S phase, which makes sense because it inhibits S cyclin CDK. So you would want to degrade the inhibitor when you need that complex to be active. And it also, um, yeah. Any other questions? Anyone, anyone? I feel like maybe I'm boring you today. Are we bored? No? Okay, that's good. Anyways, okay. <laughs> just reflecting. Sometimes you want to reflect, right? I had a really great idea for a project today on my way to school. And so I was thinking about it and thinking about it, and then I realized, like, oh, wait, my kids are talking to me. That was a really sad moment. <laughs> Actually, they were just trying to pass trash to me from the back seat. So probably the fact that I wasn't listening wasn't too bad. I'm like, like, when you're a mom, you become like the trash man. Like, you're always being given trash, and people are requesting food. Like, that's, you're like a, you're like a, I don't know. Okay, why so many levels of regulation? So I'm telling you that you can phosphorylate things to activate things. You can phosphorylate things to inhibit things. You can have these proteins that bind and inhibit things. Um, you can also degrade things when you don't need them. Why so many levels of regulation? Why not just control cyclin synthesis and degradation? Isn't that good enough? Why not just do that? Yeah. Would it be more energy efficient to not create and degrade cyclins, but have them act more active as you need them? So in an energy sense, activating your deactivation of cycles. So what I'm hearing is the activation or inactivation of a complex is more en through phosphorylation. It's more energy efficient than constantly creating and degrading. Yes. Uh, well, it sounds like it's pretty important. So you wouldn't want just one thing controlling it. You want a whole slew of things. So if just one goes down, you have lots of other backup stuff. Cell cycle is important. You don't want one thing. You want backup, a backup plan. Yep. Or if there's a mistake in one of the processes, it stops the situation. So those mistakes will keep repeating and keep repeating. So if there's a mistake in one process, of right, one, one mechanism of regulation, um, it shuts the system down. It shuts the system down. Yep. Right, so it's a fail-safe mechanism of regulation. It's more than one way. So I think all of you are kind of right. Yeah, so, so in terms of energy efficiency, you are constantly um, making and breaking. But, but if you think about it, it takes a while to build up your cyclins. Um, 
And so I don't know that the cell is going to be like, boom, lots of acetylene. You know, so it's just this gradual increase. But you need to keep it inactive until it's, it's needed. So phosphorylation is one way of having like a quick on and off. Um, and then having these proteins is one way of a quick on and off. So it's, it's a combination of efficiency and, um, yeah, a lot of it's about efficiency. And the other thing is, yeah, you really want to have these things tightly, tightly regulated by multiple mechanisms because if, these, if the cell cycle goes wrong, what's, what happens to the organism? No, the organism probably will not survive. Right. Any questions about this, these concepts? Makes sense, right? Yeah. Okay. Does anyone want to talk, talk about anything obscure? Yes. Could you also add that, um, like, when you go into uh, M phase, you aren't actually going to be transcribing anything, so all of the players actually have to be already present to be activated. When you go into M phase, you're not going to have uh, uh, gene expression. Everything kind of needs to be there and active and ready to go. Or kind of like trigger, trigger nearly pulled. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Okay, so these are some of the major cell cycle regulatory proteins. So you can say, yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, what would you do if I read this list to you right now? <laughs> I was just thinking about that. CDK, after get... <laughs> God, that would be horrible. Um, so I just put these things up here for you to understand that there are a lot of different mechanisms of regulation. And you can categorize them into phosphorylation-related things, CKI-related mechanisms, and ubiquitin ligase. Pretty much. It always helps me when studying for cell biology. Well, it's not like I study for cell biology anymore. I guess I do before we class. When studying, um, it always helps me to categorize things. So, here you go. Uh, so here's an overview, right? So you have multiple things going on. There are external effects. You have activation, whether or not your cyclin CDK complexes are active. And then you have transcriptional regulation, right? So if you've got a favorable environment, if you've got a favorable environment, you'll get activation of G1CDK, and then you'll start to go towards S phase. But if you've got negative external um, effects, such as DNA damage or unreplicated DNA or um, chromosomes not properly attached to the mitotic spindle, that'll inhibit all of these things from going forward. Um, and then there's transcriptional regulation in the sense that you have to have increases of the appropriate proteins in order to move forward in each phase of the cell cycle. Here's your overview. Okay. So I just told you all about CDKs being super important and how their activity is regulated by the rise and fall of cyclins. And so you should be thinking, okay, but what do they do, right? Is anyone thinking that? Yeah, okay. Um, right, because, yeah, okay, so they're kinases. What do kinases do? They phosphorylate things. Phosphorylation changes the shape of things to allow things to interact or not, right? So they're turning things on um, or turning things off. So I have a few examples of some kind of big picture um, ways to think about this. So mitogens are growth factors that stimulate cell division by stimulating G1 CDK and G1 S CDK. So this is a way of thinking about an outside signal activating <coughs> cell cycle and inducing cell division. Okay, so mitogen is coming from outside the cell at some kind of molecule, it's probably secreted by another cell, and it's going to tell the cell to divide when it binds with receptor and magical signaling happens. Um, so the main points are that it increases MYC expression 
which increases G1 cyclin CDK activity, which then activates E2F, um, and then you get F3 gene expression. So just to look at it a little bit more closely, you'll get your mitogen that's going to bind to your receptor, and then you'll get the signaling, which I'm ignoring because you're, we're not in cell biology right now. Um, and we're going to focus on what's going on in here. But remember, it's this binding here that sends all these proteins to phosphorylate each other and relay the signal for some protein to go into the nucleus and activate gene expression. And so that ends up resulting in um, expression of MYC. And if anyone has ever read anything about cancer, you've probably heard that MYC is frequently mutated or dysregulated in some way in cancer. And when you think about this here, you'll kind of start to understand that. So um, MYC actually results in um, activation of G1 CDKs. And what the G1 CDK actually does when it's active, so it's been phosphorylated and it's activating, so it's an active CDK, what it does is it phosphorylates, because remember it's kinase, it phosphorylates um, RB, so it looks like a mustache. I love that. Do you love it when it's all... No, forget it. Okay. It phosphorylates. There's no mustache involved. Come on. Um, it phosphorylates the mustache, and that liberates E2F, and E2F is a transcription factor that activates... S phase gene expression, which includes transcription um, of these different cyclins, which result in activation, further activation of G1S CDK and active S CDK. S CDK is what actually is required for um, DNA synthesis to occur. And so that's that first step in the cell cycle, S phase, right? So, um, and it all has to do with this CDK being active and phosphorylating RB, which is an inhibitor of E2F. You phosphorylate it, it changes its shape, it can no longer bind to E2F, and then E2F is active and able to stimulate gene expression. Okay? <coughs> Questions? Comments? Confusions? Happiness? presence of E2F promotes the transcription of more E2F? Positive feedback. Positive feedback, yep. There's positive feedback. And in addition, so usually transcription factors don't just promote the transcription of one gene. They promote the transcription of many genes. So that's one thing is they turn on that feedback loop, and then they also um, activate transcription of S cyclic, which then activates S CDK, which then results in activation of DNA replication. Okay. So that's how it all comes together. Well, one example. I guess there could probably be 50. I think I might have more for you. Questions? Yes? This is unrelated, but um, what's the difference between retinoblastoma and the actual cancer retinoblastoma? Um, what's the difference between RB and cancer RB? Yeah. A mutation. Okay, so it's just a mutation in? Yeah. So what do you think that mutation might be? Mutation in uh, improper binding, or non-inactivation, or non-inactivation. So probably, let's let me think about it for just one minute. Okay. Right, because um, because RB, if it's active, needs to bind E2F, mm -hmm. and if it couldn't bind E2F, that would promote some cycle. Right. Yeah. Right, and. Um, my guess is there are some other modifications that are required for that binding of the fourth. But yeah, so probably a mutation in either of these sites wouldn't be the, wouldn't cause cancer, or would it? What do you guys think? A mutation in the phosphorylation site probably wouldn't, because then you couldn't liberate E2F. Unless there was something else going on. I know, that's a very, very straightforward way of looking at it. Um, but yeah, so so it, it was these individuals who had retinoblastoma that they characterized these mutations. Okay. So 
Good question. Any other questions? Okay. Does the lack of questions mean that this is crystal clear or that I've lost you so badly? Or that you're busy memorizing histone stuff? <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to take the non-answer to mean that it's crystal clear, because that's what I want to do. I saw a thumbs up. I like to see a thumbs up from people that I don't expect that there will already automatically be thumbs up from. I want to see a thumbs up from someone who doesn't even make eye contact with me. Um, so this is just a nail, a nail, put another nail in the coffin. Um, Phosphorylation of RB by cyclin CDK liberates E2F. So you've got RB binding and inhibiting E2F. This CDK that is active because it's bound to cyclin, it um, phosphorylates RB that prevents it from interacting with E2F, so it goes away. It doesn't look like a mustache here. And um, then E2F can go on and activate gene expression, resulting in S phase gene expression and other things. Okay. Yeah. Where does the cyclin come from? I love it. Where does the cyclin come from? Who, who wants to answer that? I could answer it, but I bet, I bet everyone in here may think of it. You know, let's make that into a chit chat with your friend question. Okay, so the question was okay, where does this cyclin come from? Everyone talk to your friend for a minute, and I want an answer. An essay for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one you're talking about. Okay, so do you guys need another minute to talk? Are you guys deep in conversation? Okay. So you don't need to know the exact answer, but if you can get close to it. So the question was, where's this cyclin coming from, right? Because I'm saying, well, this is here, which activates this, which then does this, blah, 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 blah. Um, so the thing to remember is this is all, so this is, so the very, like, there's no problem with this answer, but I'm not completely answering it kind of answer would be gene expression. <laughs> Something is activating gene expression in response to a signal. There's, there's been a signal that's come into the cell, activated some signaling pathway, some kind of regulatory protein has gone into the nucleus, activated transcription of some gene, which is going to then activate transcription of the cyclin. Um, and that's what you're seeing here. I'm going to get you one second. That's what you're seeing here, right? Because you've got the signaling coming from, so there's a mitogen. Sometimes this works. I don't ever see it. Huh? Never can see the Really? Should I go right here? Mitogen. <laughs> 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 to make sure mitogen. 
Grass is tucked into my pants. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so embarrassing. <laughs> okay, so you've got a mitogen. I know, you know what? Let's blame Dr. Tsunji. I'm going to blame her because she told me to buy it. Actually, the biology department bought it. Okay. Um, so, um, so mitogen binds, signaling magic, gene regulatory protein, or transcription factor, whatever you want to call it, goes in, activates gene expression, which then um, results in MYC expression, which further activates more gene expression, which includes the cyclin, which then activates this G1 CDK. G1 CDK activates the cell, but then you get this feedback which then uh, results in expression of cyclin E and cyclin A, which is G1S and S cyclin, which then comes back and kind of reinforces the whole thing. Did anyone um, come to this conclusion? If you say gene expression, you're right, because you have to think about everything very holistically. Every single thing that happens to a cell is somehow affecting gene expression. Remember, the cell is responding to its environment. Right, so if it's saying, hey, we need to go into S phase, something's happening that's going to form some sort of signaling pathways and something into the nucleus, which then going to upregulate some, some cycling, right? Um, yes? That one? Well, I guess it depends. The question was, let's say the mitogen binds and then something else is also binding to some other receptor, or is there some way that the cell prioritizes what's going to be expressed? It depends on how you think of this. Do you think of it as one highway with an on-ramp and an off-ramp, or do you think of it as just the interstate highway system full of many different... So, like, every signaling pathway is happening concurrently. Gene expression, millions <coughs> of genes. Millions? Lots of genes are happening. I don't know. Some numbers person can come up with that for a great. What? There are 500,000 express genes. 500,000 express genes. So millions of genes. That's like what my kids are like. Is a million a number? I'm like, I don't know. It's big. Um, I always want to say it's 10 to the 6, but then I, I'm like, you're 5, so 10 to the 6 is <laughs> But yeah, so so there's a lot of genes being expressed at the same time. So if you've got, you know, while this is happening, if you're a breast cancer cell, you probably also have estrogen coming into your cell and binding to your estrogen receptor, which is then going and stimulating those genes. You've got so much going on at the same time. Um, yeah. I guess we can get more detailed in that conversation, but we, we won't. Yes. Um, okay, mitogen in this picture looks like it's a signal coming from another cell that has triggered the cell cycle. But in a single cell organism, uh, like that, could a mitogen just be a just conditional thing that says that the environment is suitable to replicate? Mitogen means like things that promotes cell division. So it could be um, nutrient related. It could be maybe pathogen related. Right? It says you usually multiply when you multiply something. Um, I'm bad at thinking of single cell organisms, so you'll have to excuse me because I always think in terms of, you know, 293 T cell. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah, mitogen is just a thing that encourages cell division. Any other questions? Okay, are we happy? Are we understanding how that cell and molecular biology is this beautiful, holistic picture? Are we feeling, wow, this is amazing. I love biology. <laughs> Dr. Ehrlich is awesome. No? Okay, thumb up, good. <laughs> okay, so let's move forward. We've got, we've got plenty of time. Okay. So cyclin D CDKs regulate proteasomal degradation of different substrates. Right? So I was talking about how important 
how sporulation was and things, but then they also talked about how important it is to regulate different protein levels, be it cyclins or CKIs or all sorts of things. Right? And so I told you about FCFs, and I said, FCFs recognize phosphorylated substrates. Well, what's phosphorylating them? Some active cyclin TDK. Okay? So this is how it becomes a fairly complicated network of, of uh, phosphorylations and degradations, but it's kind of beautiful <coughs> and cool if you think about it. You love it? I wish we had brownies today. <laughs> okay. Um, APC, remember that was the other ubiquitin ligase we were talking about, anaphase promoting complex, is required for progression to anaphase and exit for mitosis. Um, and so this was an, a, an experiment that uh, I believe we will talk about next week in recitation. I don't know, sometimes I might change it up. Maybe we won't talk about anything. Um, wild type cells with um, normal APC, they are dividing, you know, they don't, they're not all synchronized, so there are different phases of cell division. And then if you um, have mutant cells, again, this is kind of like these yeast, these uh, mutant yeast that we've been talking about. If you have mutant CDC16, which is uh, basically result in inactive APC, then you are stuck in this just before anaphase spot. And so you can't exit mitosis. And so APC um, targets many substrates, including m cyclin and securin, right? And don't forget, activation of APC requires phosphorylation off the bone. So let's go through this here. Activation of APC by MCDK, it makes sense, right, that your MCDK is going to activate APC because you need to degrade all these things to exit mitosis, right? So activation of APC by MCDK and CDC20 interaction results in secure degradation and activation of separase. So separase, so here's... You can imagine it like this. You've got securin and you've got separase. Separase is this enzyme that cleaves cohesin. And cohesin is a protein or protein complex that um, holds together sister chromatins. Did you ever wonder how they separate? Why they're together? And you think, did you think the mitotic spindle was here in nature? Like the incredible hole? Huh? <laughs> did, did we learn about something where, like, if mitotic spindles attach more than one place, it could potentially pull apart. But like this is still taking this is still involved, right? So you need separase to cleave. Yeah, so it's not, but it's not just tearing apart chromosome. You need separase to cleave all of these protein complexes holding holding the sister chromatids together. And so the way this works is you've got your MCDK and it activates APC by encouraging CDC20 APC interaction through phosphorylation. And um, then you get then you get active APC, which degrades securin, which allows active separates to be available to then cleave to then cleave the cohesins, and then you can actually separate my separate the sister chromatids by the, by the mitotic um, How does activate, oh, why did I put this here? How does activation of APC by MCK create a negative feedback loop? You know what? I took this from my cell biology lecture. Let's hold <coughs> off on that because I don't think I gave you enough information to discuss that. Okay. Well, here it is. M-cyclo <laughs> CDK activates APC and also targets itself. Here's the negative feedback loop. Targets itself for degradation, promoting exit for mitosis. Right? So you've got your APC that's active. It's activated, separates by degrading securin. It's 
degraded all those cohesin complexes, so you're able to actually separate your chromosomes. It also degrades M cyp. Hmm. Um, and then, so here you have your normal M cyclin CDK, and it will degrade M cyclin. And actually, degradation of M cyclin is required to exit mitochondria. So it actually creates a negative feedback loop where it shuts itself off, and there's a way to deal with that because you need it on for other things. Any questions? That is it. Whoa, I should have put more slides today. So, thanks for no early. Good. Those of you who are taking, um, unless you have any questions, we can talk for a minute. For those of you who are taking the exam today, take this time to go get something to eat. Because it sucks to take an exam on any stomach. Let me just turn this on. <laughs> <laughs>